Thank you for being a part of this love revolution. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your healing journey. And thank you during a time like this when the world can sometimes seem more backwards than right side up. Thank you for daring to open your heart and participating in the awakening of humanity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's always amazing when I feel into the energy of the group and I always tune into, okay, so what am I gonna, what am I gonna say? And because when I was invited to come here, it was because of the popularity of my first book, Whatever Arises, Love That. And so in the spirit of that, I wanted to talk and weave through tonight's talk new ways of looking at and embracing unconditional love. And unconditional love is the cornerstone of the new spiritual paradigm. We are at a time in history where if a teaching is not rooted in love, it may not be as helpful as it is interesting. Have you noticed this predicament in spiritual paths? Something can be interesting, but not very helpful. <laughs> Have you noticed this? Like for example, there's a, lot of, there's a, there's a theory going around that the, the earth is flat. That's interesting. Not helpful. <laughs> Someone asked me, they go, Matt, do you think the earth is flat? I really don't know. I haven't really thought about it. I don't know. When I was a kid, I was taught the earth was round, and I thought, well, the people on this hemisphere are obviously upside down. I don't know how all this works, because when you go to that continent, it's all right side up. I don't know. It's interesting. Not very helpful. So in the new paradigm, what we have are teachings that can be interesting, but are always helpful. And as long as it's rooted in love, it is always helpful. And with tonight's talk and transmission of healing energy, celebrating and honoring the vibration of unconditional love, we are going to answer a very interesting question in many different ways. A question called, what would love do? Because in any given moment, we can measure our spiritual progress against how much of us or how little of us is willing to do what love would do. And to be a truly enlightened master in these modern day times, we cannot be too enlightened to be loving and heart-centered, just as we cannot be so loving that we lose sight of our discernment and wisdom. So it's a balancing act. It's not exiting the mind to open your heart, although that's a very popular, clever campaign. It's interesting, but not helpful. Here's why. If you subscribe to, oh yeah, just get out of your head into your heart, like it's really marketable. Yeah, get out of your head into your heart. What do you wind up doing? Two things. 
you wind up telling yourself all day, I should get out of my head and get into my heart, which you can only do in your head. <laughs> and then you take a break from that and you tell other people, you should get out of your head and into your heart. <laughs> to be in your heart does not require you to get out of your head. There are some of us who are just wired to be analytical thinkers, and it doesn't mean that you're unlovable or unloving. Instead, whether you're an analytical thinker, whether you're an empathic being, we simply, in all of the ways in which we are created to be, answer the question, what would love do? And what love would do is the theme of new paradigm spirituality, which is the opposite of the outdated old spiritual paradigm. And again, the old spiritual paradigm is not wrong. It's just a little outdated. It's just antiquated. The old spiritual paradigm can be boiled down into one constant process called blame the experiencer. People have experiences. There's misfortune. There's disappointment. There's unexpected circumstances. <clears throat> Maybe you've had this experience. Have you ever intended to have a certain outcome? And the opposite happens. And then you might go into the old paradigms, little dance called blame the experiencer. Is it my vibration? Is it my energy? Is it my karma? Am I being punked by my spirit guides? <laughs> my vision board was very clear. Mmm, <laughs> I know. There's pictures on the opposite side, too. I didn't check that. Mm. On the front, it's Hawaii, and holding hands with my soulmate on the back, it's mayhem. I didn't. <sighs> Is my law of attraction skills broken? Do you see this? is all blame the experiencer. Oh, it's because I didn't forgive so-and-so. <sighs> My parent passed away and I wasn't eye-gazing the moment they left their body. Everything but the old paradigm is the reason why you're having this misfortune is because something is less than in you. That's how you know something is illusory. That's not, that's interesting. It's not helpful. What would love do? What would love do? Love would do the opposite. Love would honor the experiencer. Love would say there is a very good reason why this is happening to you. We realize this is not the most popular circumstance, but this is happening as a setup to initiate you into a level of consciousness where you are going to touch into a level of fulfillment beyond any outcome you can perceive. You didn't choose this outcome. You were the one who were chosen for this mission. You may think you chose to come down here. We chose you to come into this earth plane and wake this planet up. And although it looks like you're being twisted and unraveled and broken into a million pieces, it is only to create enough space for the light of heavenly perfection to flow through you and transform this planet for future generations to come. What love would do is honor the experiencer to give you the space and capacity to embrace your experience. 
the ability to honor the spiritual value of an experience that doesn't necessarily feed the desires of your ego is the benchmark of spiritual maturity. And what gets us from the human plight of ego, where you define yourself by the ups and downs of your career, your relationship life, your social status, your bank account, whatever you want to use to measure yourself with external means. The shift out of that identification and into the identification with the light of your soul as a unique expression of source energy. That shift occurs through the opening and expanding of your heart. And it is only love that can help you through this shift from start to finish. What love would do is honor you no matter how you are experiencing any moment. No matter what you think, no matter what you feel, no matter how you respond, love says, thank you for acting this out the way you were created to be. There is free will. But before you can access free will, you have to know it's all destined. Once you know it's all destined, then you can start making some really badass choices. So in this shift from ego to soul, which I also talk about in my second book, everything is here to help you. There's two ways in which love is perceived. There's the ego's view and there's the soul's view. And they're very clearly different views. The soul's view is love is the only way. And boy, isn't that a very beautiful statement to subscribe to when life is going your way? <laughs> but the ego's version is, I would love to get my way all the time. So one side is love is the only way, and the other one is I would love to get my way. Now you can clearly see which one of those is going to be constantly disturbed by the perfection of life's grand plan for your life. The ego loves to get its way. The ego desires outcomes that will give it the feelings it desires. And the pitfall of ego, because ego is not something we condemn. Again, to condemn the ego is to blame the experiencer. And that's not what love would do. Love would look at the ego like a precocious child and say, they are just growing into themselves. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to say the next time you do something you're not proud of? Sorry, I'm growing into myself. <laughs> I'm growing into myself. <laughs> and your reaction tells me, so are you. <laughs> That's why we're friends. But the predicament of ego, just on an emotional and energetic level, is that the ego always desires a love that is greater than the love they can give or receive. Which is why a lot of times if we're desiring a deep relationship in our ego, as soon as we meet someone who might be that person, we now, instead of being excited about the love we finally found, now we have something really amazing and important that we're afraid to lose. There's no greater sign that we're unintentionally lost in our egos that when you meet someone that might be the one, and instead of elation, there's anxiety. The universe goes, look, we finally brought you a person, and you are a mess. <laughs> and the universe sees this and goes, we don't want them to be scared. We should, we should do this less often. <laughs> the universe doesn't want to scare you. And so if you, the universe brings you love, potentially, and instead of going, oh boy, let's just see, if all of a sudden it's, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, 
Do they like me? Do they like me? Like me? Oh my God, where's my pendulum? <laughs> Listen, spiritual people, I love you all. Don't pendulum a partner. Rule number one of tonight, if you have to pendulum a partner, they're not it. <laughs> Just... <laughs> so funny. But the ego has a really big predicament because it desires a love that it doesn't know is greater than the love it can give and receive. And you, you, you've experienced this because you live in a world where a lot of people walk around with their hearts closed as if that space is reserved for someone else. Do you ever have that experience? Where people are in traffic or they're on the subway or they're going in the store and everyone, nope, nope, sorry, sorry, that's closed. That's reserved for some person I don't know. I don't know where they are, but it's not you. <laughs> no, 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 don't look at me. You're going you're gonna to rob some of it, and I won't have it for them. Here's the thing. When you close your heart as if I'm waiting for that special thing, that means you are not practicing keeping your heart open. And then when that special thing or person comes, if you haven't practiced having an open heart, you won't be able to open it for the person you've been waiting for. That's what the ego doesn't know. It thinks it's closing down and preserving for the right person. But it doesn't know that you have to practice giving and receiving love unconditionally. So when a potential partner comes about, you're able to receive it with worthiness and not be filled with anxiety or not to sabotage the situation. Because the ego's biggest fear is it's afraid to open its heart, it's afraid to love unconditionally, it's afraid to let someone see all of their glorious perfection, because what if it's not enough? What if I open my heart and I show someone the light I shine with no hesitation, with no holding back? And what if I show someone my best and it still isn't enough? That's the fear. And so the ego holds its heart closed, waiting for the right person to open up to. And because it's practiced shutting down more than it's practiced opening up, it will then have the greatest problem opening up even when the right partner arrives. So the reason we live in a world of interacting with various people and places surrounded by things, crossing paths with someone else's son and mother and father, and even if you walk past someone who's not the one for you, every person you meet is someone else's soulmate. And when you learn to respect every human being from that level of consciousness, you are saying to every person you cross paths with, thank you for giving me the chance to practice opening my heart. For when in the presence of the one I'm truly meant to love, I'll be able to give and receive them fully. So thank you. And so it's a daily practice of opening our heart. And even if you're a heart-centered person, the practice deepens to the higher levels of mastery that say, how much more can I open my heart? How much more can I open my heart so that instinctively, instead of seeing someone on the street and labeling them a stranger, I honor and respect and sometimes help and support them as someone else's child, as someone else's soulmate? as someone else's hero. And when we live on that edge of respect 
and loyalty for the light in all human beings and not just reserving it for special relationships. Maybe you reserve certain behaviors for special relations. I get it, right? But you don't withhold your greatest qualities from recognizing the greatest qualities in other people. Because as empaths, and empaths meaning you tend to either match or take on the energy of other people. As empaths, it means you get lost in the energy of other people. You don't know what's theirs and what's yours. As empaths, what we tend to do is we, when we don't walk around with an intention, we get sucked into reflecting to people their own self-image. So if you leave the house and you set the intention that says, I am going to honor the divinity in every person and I'm going to at least smile and relate to every person as someone else's child and someone else's soulmate and someone else's hero. I'm going to acknowledge their light just by knowing that. If you don't have that intention, your lack of intention is going to be attracted to someone who equally has a lack of intention. And you're gonna wind up perceiving them as a reflection of how they see themselves, and then you're gonna think you just judged that person. You ever like walk down the street and you like just see someone and you kind of revolt or you pull away, or you shut down? You're acting out how they see themselves. And how they see themselves is a recording of how they've been seen by other people in their lives. So when we are a part of the love revolution, we are literally helping energetically to break the inner cycle of self-judgment and of course breaking the cycle of abuse by not reflecting to other people their own misperceptions of self-image. Because we're too busy engaging in the act of intention that says, I'm too busy looking at each person as someone else's son or daughter, someone else's hero, or someone else's soulmate. I'm too busy looking for those qualities in another, so at least in my presence, they will have a momentary break from their own inner doubt and judgment. And the more often you spend time seeing other people from this perspective, the more you are gifted with the beauty of an open heart which will allow you to give and receive love at the same level that you desire change in your life. In order to get there, we don't blame the experiencer. We honor the experiencer. Because every single thing you think, say, and do was created exactly the way it is simply because at the end of every momentary experience, you are always a little bit wiser and a little bit more aware than when the moment began, which is why we learn in retrospect. And maybe in that moment, you weren't the way you wanted to be. You were just the way you were designed to be. And the reason you wanted to be different is because your intuition knows in the future you're going to be better. But you have to trust life enough to know that you're always going to be better than you were before. <clears throat> and not because your ego tries to be in charge of the spiritual journey, but because life is always ushering you into higher levels of consciousness. Your job is not to control and micromanage this. Your job is to love the innocence within you that experiences life exactly the way you do. And because your heart beats in all bodies, the more you love yourself, the more others remember how worthy they are to be loved. And the more you love yourself, the more likely you are 
to honor the light of others as someone's child, someone's hero, someone's soulmate. And of course, through the laws of unity consciousness, the more you practice doing that each day, the more fulfilled you're going to be, not just when life goes your way, but because you've realized love is the only way. Love is the only way. That's what love knows. And in any moment of doubt, at the brink of despair, under the most insurmountable odds, that's what love would do. But let's deepen this. Because we know love is the highest vibration in existence. But let's unpack what it really means to love, or maybe one of many ways to define what it means to love. Because otherwise, if we don't know how to actively love, you're just going to go from this talk and tell yourself all day you should be more loving, which is the same dance as out of your head into your heart. You're just going to walk around and tell people, hey, whatever arises, love that. <laughs> what do you mean? Read the book. <laughs> what does it mean to love? When love is taught, or when love is expressed, it's dynamic, not passive. So many of us who were loved by people that also either neglected or abused us, learn to be in a passive state because of those big messages. So many of us are, are still caught in abuse cycles of neglect and abuse and betrayal that we love passively but because our nervous system is still shocked by the trauma of mixed messaging. Even a parent, God bless them, raising their voice at you, condemning them, or condemning you for asking a question during a moment they didn't have any patience. Making you feel unsafe to share your experience and then following it up with, I love you, later that night or even shortly thereafter. So when we have mixed messaging, our love becomes very passive. And then we have this very strange experience and very painful experience of opening our heart to love and feeling more taken advantage of than fulfilled. And I'd like to change that for you. Love is dynamic. Love is courageous. Love is bold. It's not showy. It's not showy. That's the ego. And it's funny how the ego turns everything into a performance. Someone's having a hard day. Oh, that's okay. Please, everyone. Back up. I'm going to love this person. <laughs> Have no fear, love is here. That's the ego. Love is dynamic. Love is bold. But love is solemn. It is peaceful. It is humble. It just gives with no attachment to how its gifts are received. But there's a dynamic way to access love, and I'm going to teach you tonight. And it's something that I received from the universe in a download I received a week and a half ago. And when I got it, I thought, oh, that's good. I love that. Because here's the thing. None of us need to know how to, lo how to love when life's going your way. It's easy to love when life's going your way. When life's going your way, everyone's your friend. When life's going your way, nothing's a big deal, right? The question is, how do you love when your ego is being challenged? 
How do you love in circumstances that don't feel fair? And you know why some circumstances don't feel fair? Because they're not. That might just be a moment of unexpected healing. Things don't feel fair because they're not. Look, I wrote a book called Everything is Here to Help You. I didn't write a book called Life is Fair. Because <laughs> life isn't fair. And do you know why? Life is too miraculous and perfect to be fair. Fairness is like an eye for an eye. You hurt me, I get to hurt you, and we're good. When you see how perfect everything is orchestrated, fairness has nothing to do with it. The only degree of fairness there will be is that every opportunity is going to make you so much better than you've ever been. You'll one day look back and go, now I can appreciate why that happened. But not until that occurs to you. But what will get you there is the dynamic power of love and action. So how do we love dynamically? How do we love boldly? Here's a funny way to think of it. How do we love ruthlessly? Passionately. It's very simple. It is the willingness to take a moment of your time and whether to someone you have a conflict with, someone you've been hurt by in the past, someone in the news who might trigger you, <laughs> whoever that might be, <laughs> whether you watch him at a press conference, you follow him on Twitter, Whoever that might be, I don't know, you know, just hypothetically. <laughs> to take any person that has hurt you or who is a great, great example of how quickly you can be turned away from love and turn towards righteousness. Whoever has the power in your life to do that, you take a moment of your time and you do what love would do. And what love would do is to bless that person with all the joy their heart desires. And the ego goes, why would I do that? <laughs> right? The ego is like an amateur Santa Claus. The ego has a nice list and a naughty list. And the soul says, let's take everyone on the naughty list and bless them with all the joy their heart desires. And the ego says, that's not how this works. <laughs> the reason we do that is because if the people who hurt you, intentionally or unintentionally, were blessed with all the joy their heart desires, they'd be fulfilled. And in a state of fulfillment, no one else would be their victim. So the blessing is helping to break the cycle of violence and abuse in whoever it exists in. And the ones in which it still exists are the ones who have hurt betrayed, abandoned, or triggered you. And you, as a soul in human form, think you're just a person in a planet being wronged. What you are is a spirit guide who is on this planet dressed up like a human being, learning how to be a guide and an angel to evolving souls. And you don't know who you're here to guide and help evolve. And the universe reminds you who you're here to help heal once that person wrongs you. And once you are wronged, 
You either carry their pattern of pain in your cellular body, and now it becomes yours to heal. Or you say, thank you for reminding me of my power as a spirit guide and angel in training. You have wronged me because my light has the power to liberate you. In the name of breaking the cycle of violence and breaking the cycle of abuse, I bless your heart with all the joy your heart desires. For in a higher level of fulfillment, you or anyone else will no longer be a target. That's what love would do. The question is, when do we start doing that? And when you employ a strategy like I'm describing, you will find the most incredibly potent spiritual process that exists to be unearthed. It is actually the vibration of forgiveness, but the way I'm describing it increases the potency of forgiveness for those whose perception of forgiveness feels more weak and disempowering. Because for many, forgiveness feels like you're saying, it was okay, this happened to me. It doesn't have to be okay. Nothing that has happened to you has to be okay. And in fact, if what happened to us was so not okay, then the most reasonable thing to do would be to bless this person with all the joy their heart desires so the not okay thing that happened to you doesn't happen to another. And why do we want to make sure it doesn't happen to another? Because another is someone else's child someone else's hero, and someone else's soulmate. We live for the well-being of others, and that is how we get over ourselves. That's how you get out of ego. And I will tell you that when I was given this download, because when I'm given downloads by the universe, I like to practice what I've, I've downloaded. I can feel the energy, and then when I'm on stage and I'm transmitting, I know the trajectory. I know the vibration. And so as an exercise, I sat, and I thought, let me go through my life, and let me call up one by one all the people that have ever hurt me. Now, in my current reality, in my current dimension... I'm, I'm pretty okay with everyone in my life. But I could go back and remember in my life when at different ages I was triggered and wronged and hurt. So I did that. And one by one, I would call up the image of the person in my mind. And I would say, may you be blessed with all the joy your heart desires. For in a heart of unlimited fulfillment, you or anyone else will no longer be your target. One by one, I did this. And I started to feel a very powerful energy. And then I decided, let's make it interesting. And then I went to fascist dictators in history. And I wanted to see what would happen when I spent a specific amount of time praying for the salvation and well-being of people who have done the unthinkable, inhumane, cruel acts to other people. And what I found was a level of liberation, a depth of love, that even in the presence of unthinkable cruelty is only concerned with equally helping all. 
Because in the body of a predator is a victim who hasn't been healed. That's why that predator is trying to free themselves of their pain by projecting it onto another person. And the pain they are always projecting onto another person is always a person naturally at a higher vibration of consciousness. Because that person at a higher level of consciousness has been chosen as, you are the one I'm going to remind that I have unresolved pain that I don't know how to deal with. And you are closer to the vibration of forgiveness that when you forgive me by blessing me with all the joy my heart desires, we will both be up-leveled in consciousness. That doesn't sound fair. And it will be totally unfair when you have received all the pain, betrayal, and damage someone can dish out to you and you haven't responded back with the opposite vibration of light. That's what's unfair. Because someone who hurts, hurts others. You've probably heard the phrase, hurt people, hurt people. I like to say, free people, free people. Hurt people attract free people or people that are closer to liberation than they are. And the setup is you will be wronged. And when you forgive that person, you both will be up leveled. Now, if you lead with the intention of I'm going to see every person as the light of consciousness, someone's child, someone's relative, someone's hero, someone's best friend, someone's soulmate. When you start leading with that and not waiting for something in life to hurt you before you forgive, then the vibrational energy shifts. And instead of you having to be wronged for you then to send the light and you're just sending the light first, you begin to attract out of every person around you only the versions of them that are aligned with the light. And if no part of them is aligned with the light, any injustice or cruel act that they were planning to do to someone will be circumvented and they will be redirected away from you. And then there will be a greater time that goes by before their next attack or assault on someone else. So we don't have to be light workers who just wait for pain before we heal other people. We could just lead an offensive love revolution. Sound familiar? An offensive love revolution that says, I'm not going to wait for someone to wrong me to remind me that I'm here to help evolve their soul. I'm going to walk around this planet and blast every human being with the most joyful love, honor, graciousness, recognition, generosity until I want to burst into a million pieces. I'm going to love so deeply that I might step back and think I'm going a little crazy. Because it takes almost going a little crazy with the light you shine to start affecting the positive change in a world that looks as crazy as ours. People want to be committed to pain, committed to addiction, committed to vengeance, committed to judgment, committed to righteousness. We have to be just as committed to love. Thank you. <laughs> I never know when that's going to happen. Oh. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you hear that, YouTube? You hear that, YouTube? Ah, oh, thank you. So funny, YouTube. <laughs> Every month I put a video out. Here's a funny story. 
I put a YouTube video out every month, and I always will do this. And, you know, it comes out, and I get a lot of positive responses from my videos. I'm very humbled by that. It's very lovely. And I started to notice this a few months ago. And then I became like a little detective in my life. And I started noticing, like, literally minutes after a video was posted, there's one thumbs down. <laughs> like, there's someone out in YouTube land waiting for my team to put a video. Oh, is this the day? It's like, they're gonna look. Matt caught a new video? Nope. Mm. And as soon as a new video comes out, hmm. It's so amazing that we can do online what we can't do in everyday life. Like that person can't stand outside of my house and just go, mm -hmm. I hate this guy that I don't even know. It's amazing. And every time I see that, what do I do? I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. For in a heart overflowing with fulfillment, maybe you won't spend time behind a keyboard putting your thumbs down on a heart-centered spiritual teacher <laughs> that you've probably never met. I totally want to meet this person. <laughs> and if I do, do you know what I'm going to do? Thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs up all day. Everyone gets thumbs up from me. That's what love would do. I'm not a heart-centered person because I choose to be heart-centered. Let me just make this point really clear. And you're not a heart-centered person because you choose to be. We're heart-centered people because we can't help but feel and love. We can't help it. But when you start directing your love in this type of intentional way, the you that can't help but love and feels like being heart-centered is more of a terminal illness and a recipe for disaster, a recipe to be victims and doormats for narcissists of all shapes and sizes. Instead, when you start leading with this offensive love revolution to answer the question, what would love do? Instead of attracting experiences that you have to tell yourself are for your own good and evolution, you will start attracting experiences that reflect back to you the light that you deliberately put into the field of consciousness. And instead of you being the light in a darkened world, you will start having a world reflect to you the light that you deliberately and boldly shine in all directions. And when you can bless someone who has misperceived you, judged you, hurt you, with all the joy their heart desires, something breaks open in your mind. And there's no longer this ongoing list of people are this or people are that. All those categories get eliminated. And there is simply love to share. And when there is simply love to share, you will live in a world that works harder to support your every need and desire than you work to love and fulfill it. And in order to get yourself to the place where you can love at this edge I'm speaking of, it begins by loving yourself. And maybe some of us have the experience of inner critics, maybe not you, maybe someone you know. <laughs> maybe you have an inner critic that's not so nice to you. So that's where the process begins, when your mind is being all-consuming with fear-based what-ifs, 
when your mind is being judgmental and critical towards your behavior, appearance, lifestyle. Take your pick, body shape. You can stop and don't disagree with your mind. Don't be your mind's life coach. You're not your mind's life coach, you're its liberator. And you say to your mind, I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. For in a mind overflowing with fulfillment, you or anyone else will no longer be the target. And the first predator that we disarm is the imaginary one lurking in our minds. Because the predator of the inner critic of your own mind is an imprint a constant repeating and orbiting of all the things that other people have done and said to you, like a broken record of reoccurring pain. So let's try this together. Let's make this interesting. To my inner critic, May you be blessed with all the joy your heart desires. For in a mind overflowing with fulfillment, you or anyone else will no longer be the target. To my ego, I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. Even without a thank you back or responding with an insult, I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. For in a body overflowing with fulfillment, You or anyone else is no longer the target. To my mother or father, whether known or unknown, I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. For in an energy field overflowing with fulfillment, You or anyone else will no longer be the target. To my ancestral lineage, throughout all dimensions, time, and space, past, present, or future, even in parallel dimensions, I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. For in a heart overflowing with fulfillment, you or anyone else will no longer be the target. To all predators, intentional or unintentional, as well as all victims throughout all continents, planets, solar systems, timelines and dimensions. I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. For in a heart overflowing with fulfillment, you or anyone else will no longer be the target. To all souls, to all incarnated beings of all dimensions, 
from all spectrums of light to all densities of darkness. I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. For in a heart overflowing with joy and fulfillment, you or anyone else will no longer be the target. And can I see when I spend a few moments blessing others with all the joy their heart desires, helping them or anyone else to not be their target? Can I feel how much less of a target I feel to the unconsciousness of the world? And maybe the safest way to exist in this planet is to constantly bless the highest joy for all. And maybe that's how I tap into the highest joy without always having to get my way. That's why love can do this. Only love can do this. This is what love does. This is what it means to be the love I am. Just feel that for a moment. Feel how powerful that is. Now, there are people in this world that are destined to stand on the front lines of a social protest, who are meant to march up the steps of Capitol Hill, and are meant to be a part of that type of uprising that is inevitable. Usually those beings that are equipped and meant to play that part of the rebellion are not empathic, energetically sensitive beings, such as yourself. We are working on an energetic level while there are some people working on a social political level. And I'm not saying one is more important than the other, you just have to know your role. If we were to be asked to take a social stand against the things that are so corrupt, it would be like an army of asthmatics. <laughs> we are equipped to energetically shift a paradigm for an entire planet. But as sensitive beings, we're tired, aren't we? We're really tired. We work in different dimensions. We do all sorts of work in the dream state. We zip out of our bodies and do all sorts of stuff we may not even be aware of. And we wake up the next day, why am I so tired? <laughs> because you are doing so much energetically. Don't feel bad about it. We all play our role. I have no problem with social rebellion, it's just not what I'm called to do. It's kind of like when a friend of mine, we were talking about sports, and he goes, oh, are you, were you interested in sports? And I said, well, until I looked in the mirror. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm five foot. I was born asthmatic. I cry pretty frequently. <laughs> and it seems the universe has balanced that out with a healthy dose of confidence and charisma. <laughs> so you kind of figure you're, you're, you're <laughs> thank you, thank you.
Yay! And it's not like, ah, oh, God, Matt, thank God you didn't go into sports. I don't think I would have been led into sports, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I think I was just being a little intuitive. I mean, you know, I get it. But you know your role. As energetically sensitive beings, we may not have the most intact adrenal system. We may not have a ton of energy to throw around. But we are the ones who are feeling and processing on a collective level emotions that most of the world wouldn't be caught dead facing. We are doing such incredible light work on behalf of an entire planet. Now here's the deal. I know some of you are gonna secretly, because you know, we secretly, we don't wanna say things, but we secretly have this little meeting with ourselves or our small group of friends at our little spiritual gatherings and we go, hey, I heard that we're all doing all this work for the collective. I don't wanna do that anymore, <laughs> right? I don't want to be the universe's janitor. <laughs> I got invited to Times Square at, for New Year's and they handed me trash bags. <laughs> I thought I was a party guest. I don't want to clean up this anymore. But here's the deal. All that you would be required to do to transform yourself into your highest potential is equally all the work you're doing for an entire, an entire planet. So it's not as if you can just focus on yourself and not heal the collective. Everything you will need to heal yourself is simultaneously your greatest contribution to the collective. So even if you want to think, eh, screw the collective. <laughs> I'm just going to heal myself. I'm going to heal myself. If they all want to heal, they should buy an oracle deck or whatever's going on. <laughs> Go buy a pendulum. Make a vision board. Check both sides. Check both sides. Everything you're doing to heal the collective is also everything you need to become your highest self or a fully realized ascended master, archangel, or spirit guide in human form. So it's not as if we're doing extra work. When I talk about empaths and unity, people think I'm saying we're all, you know, <laughs> we're just doing everyone's homework. It's not what it is. It's the light within you is the light equally in all beings. And as you wake, awaken that light, it spreads out and spreads out until eventually all the work you've done to shine at full capacity will be your single greatest contribution to helping an entire world remember the light in all. That's what love does. That's what you're doing. And if you think you're here for any other reason, that's why life hurts. Let's make this very simple. Someone who sits around and constantly lists all that's wrong in the unconsciousness of the world is also spending the equal amount of time distracting themselves from the vital work of blessing others with all the joy their heart desires. And if there is some person in this world whose actions are so unconscionable that you would hold yourself back from blessing them with that joy, you've just found the edge of your ego. And that's not a judgment, that's an assessment. And most people's levels of consciousness in the collective is at a very basic level. Oh, hey, why don't you do something nice for that person? Why? What have they done for me? Do I know them? Are my friends on Facebook? <laughs> why don't they do something nice for me? I've, you know? And that's when people walk around with that attitude.
waiting for the next moment of victimhood. But we are the ones who answer the question, what would love do? And what love would do is recognize any attitude, any unsavory behavior. Isn't that a nice way of saying it? Unsavory behavior. And say, this person needs to be blessed with all the joy their heart desires. Now, you don't have to do it out loud. You don't have to do it out loud. I might do it out loud because I'm a very audacious person. And I've done it out loud in the most natural, unassuming way. I was at a grocery store and I was talking to the clerk. I said, how was your day? She says, oh, unbearable. I said, really? I said, you know what I'm going to do? And she looked at me, what? I did the straight face. I said, I'm going to bless you with all the joy your heart desires. <laughs> Just visual cues the whole thing. <laughs> and I said to her, I'm not going to do it later. I'm going to do it right now. And I hope your day, even for this moment, improves. And there was a pause. In that pause, that person had space from their own judgment and perceptions of stress and pressure. And then, of course, the ego comes right back and goes, okay, <laughs> of course. But love is willing to put itself out on the line just to give someone a millisecond of relief, even if they don't receive it. I didn't need that person to receive me. It was the love I am receiving them. I don't need to be received. I am the one receiving everyone in sight. I am receiving the innocence of all to reflect back to all that they have something worth giving. I don't need to be recognized. I don't need to be honored. But I will say this is all very nice. <laughs> Let's not stop that. But I do it because there's a love inside of me that can't stop loving. Don't blame yourself for being that way. Let it be a strength, not a weakness. It's only a weakness and not a strength when you're waiting for other people to love you back the same. Love, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's true. I don't like that one. I <laughs> tad hit too close to home. Yeah, you got me there. Your loving nature is a weakness if you are waiting for other people to love you back the same. Now, here's the caveat. Only be in intimate relationships with people who can love you back the same. I'm not saying, well, Matt said no one can love me back the same, so... Oh, well. Just lower the bar. And do you know why I say that? Spiritual people need to be told that. Because spiritual people have intuition and they don't listen to it. They're on a first date and your intuition says, nope. And you go, oh, that's judgmental. Let's give them a chance. <laughs> nope. Nope. 
You know who doesn't need chances? The right person. I'm going to give them another chance. You know who you give other chances to? The wrong person. Is that judgment? No, that's discernment. <laughs> judgment is shaming someone for being who they are or shaming yourself for that way. So you go on a first date, first five minutes, nope. You go, that's not nice. <laughs> give them a chance. And we do this because we want people to give us a chance. But your intuition is just so crystal clear. They don't even have to say anything. You just get in their field and you know. But you don't trust that. They literally turn the corner. They're walking towards you. Nope. <laughs> and then you doubt that. Oh, come on. Give them a chance. The right person doesn't need a chance. The right person is the one you can't refuse. So, as my little social message to spiritual people, be discerning, follow your intuition, always be in romantic relationships with people that can love you and be loved by you equally. But in our everyday affairs, when we are just opening our heart to be more compassionate and authentic and loving and conscious and mindful with other people, you're going to love a lot more than other people will. And when you cross paths with someone who can meet your love or exceed it, call that a national holiday. But if you understand that more likely than not, you are going to be shining a light into this world to beings who need love but don't know how to ask for or receive it. And when you know I'm probably going to love at a deeper level than other people are going to recognize me, if you know that, your love will be a strength and not a weakness. If you are loving and then looking around going, okay, my turn then the love you give to others will weaken you and will exhaust you energetically. A lot of times we get exhausted around other people because of the expectations we have for them to love us a certain way. Especially when it comes to parents. They might be in their latter years. And when parents are in their latter years, a lot of parents don't go through their spiritual evolution until they're in the last stage or chapter of their life. I almost said trimester. <laughs> Maybe because our parents can sometimes act like babies. I don't know. <laughs> but oftentimes in the last chapter of life is when someone who hasn't quite cracked open their spiritual impulse starts to go through a deep process. You ever seen someone on the deathbed who's had a crash course in spiritual reality? Right, someone's on a deathbed, hi, you have no control. I know you thought you had control, but you don't. I know there's a ton of things that you regret and wish you could do over. Yeah, you can't do that. And now you have to evolve within the last five minutes of your life. And then we sit around going, gee, mom's not being very nice, is she? Mom's got a lot on her plate. And there's some of us that hold out hope that even in the last breath, maybe I'll get that momentary experience with them that I never got before. Maybe they'll tell me the words I wanted to hear. Maybe they'll look at me and they'll say, God, I'm so sorry I was that way to you. And it's serious because some of us really want that. But do you know how you get that resolve with a parent or someone without waiting for them to give you what you give to them? By you blessing their heart with all the joy they desire. You look face to face with anyone who you hold any animosity for and silently or out loud you say, look, I bless you with all the joy your heart desires. And I know this seems like the end of one lifetime, but the, it's just the continuation in your next lifetime. I bless you with incredible fortune and joy and love. 
and you will liberate yourself from whatever you took on from them. We don't necessarily need to be fulfilled by others because our fulfillment comes from being nourished by all that pours through us depending upon how often we choose to give it. To the one that gives love often without expectation, their love will only be strengthened and it will not exhaust them. And to the one who loves often and authentically, they will love so often that the mechanism of love will be so ever flowing through their being that the love that you send to others has to pour through you before it gets to another heart, which means you will be totally fulfilled on every cell, on every body of consciousness by the love that pours through you before it even touches the heart of another, whether they accept or deny your offering. So when we give true unconditional love, we are saying thank you to the person who gives us an opportunity to give the love that fulfills us, whether they choose to receive it, ignore it, or deny it. Thank you for helping me open my heart. Thank you for helping to make my love more unconditional. Thank you for helping me transform the vibration of an entire planet. Please do with my love as you wish. Woo. So try this out loud. When I give with expectation, I'm disappointed and exhausted. When my offerings are not received, acknowledged, or reflected back. But when I love without conditions, the weakness of my giving nature becomes my biggest strength. For each and every time I choose to love, my heart opens and widens to allow a bigger and more powerful current of loving kindness to constantly pour through me to fulfill the lives of those who inspire me to give. And such a current of light like a river of bliss must first fulfill the giver before making its way into the energy field of the receiver. And even when the receiver denies, deflects, ignores, or judges in return, it is simply their soul's decision to choose when to receive more light. And if without the conscious awareness of how to integrate such a frequency, they will choose to deny what I am giving them. like someone who sees the food I've baked for them, but doesn't have the stomach to digest it. May the love that I give to others fulfill me fully 
so that I can give without expectation. So I can love without hesitation. And while I don't have to spend all day with every person, or be all things to all people, I can still honor every character that no matter the role they play in my life, they are someone's child, someone's friend, someone's hero, someone's idol, someone's beloved, someone's future spirit guide. And may I respect them no matter how they respect me. Because the vibration I embody and shine is an ongoing progress report of what I openly give most often. And so when you really feel the frequency, first of all, as we've been going through this evening, you can feel how the energy in the room just gets more intense, like I always call it like smoky barbecue energy. <laughs> because we're, we're speaking of such a truth that we're invoking the light. Everything I have you do is invoking the light. And I'm, when we come together in these experiences, we are invoking the light so you can actually have a direct, real experience of the light. We call the light, we invoke the light by speaking of the light, by seeing from the light's perspective, by speaking the words that the light speaks, by honoring the truths that the light embraces. We invoke the light, which is why when you're around people who are gossiping or judging, it feels so bad. Because, it is a, because life is an infinite space where the light is ready to be invoked. And any amount of time spent doing anything other than invoking the light creates the painful experience of having your light held back. In a world like this, you can either dare to be loving or you can choose to be right. But when you step out of yourself, whether spontaneously or gradually over time, you will come to see that all the time you have spent trying to be right, convince other people of your righteous standpoint, even when it comes at the, or from the perspective of, my point is equally as important as yours. When you do that with people, when you say, oh, you have that opinion, but mine is equally valid. When you say that, you're asking people to validate you. You're telling people, I don't know my worth and power until you tell me that I am equal to you. And you're asking their ego to free you. You don't need other people to honor, oh, you know, your point of view is equally valid. All you need is people to give you proof of any degree of suffering. And suffering is either they're debilitated from unresolved moments from their past, or they are being an adversarial character treating you as a replay of how they were treated in their past. Either way, they are there to be blessed with all the joy their heart desires. And they don't have to deserve it. Thank you. <laughs>
That's the, that clap is the dissolving of all of our inner Santa Clauses. <laughs> we no longer have to be in negotiation. We no longer have to tell people, okay, if you can be a good little boy and girl, I'm going to be nicer to you. The rules of unconditional love is people can do whatever they're going to do. I don't have to constantly be around them if they're not going to be nice and cordial and respectful. But for whatever time I'm around them, if I sense any kind of discord or pain or imbalance, that person deserves to be blessed. And if you attempt this, who can hurt you? There's a very subtle distinction I want to make to make this more real. You can be harmed. Harmed. Harmed means something happened that has created a change in me. I used to walk down the street. This is an example, by the way. I used to walk down the street, carefree, not a worry in the world, until someone jumped out of the bushes and attacked me. That's an example of being harmed. Hurt is how long that stays with you. So I am here to boldly tell you, if you employ what I am suggesting, you will never be hurt again. You may be harmed, but harm is temporary. Hurt can be eternal. And knowing the difference between harm and hurt is only something that love knows. Harm may occur, but it may not hurt the way it used to. When we hold our love back, everything hurts. And when everything hurts, we, f we perceive everyone as potentially being someone who might do harm to us. When we open our hearts, we don't hurt as often. We don't hurt as deeply. We don't hurt as long. We develop a level of psychic endurance called resilience. Resilience is how quickly do you pick yourself up from when you've fallen. Or if someone throws you to the ground, how quickly do you get back up? When we hurt, it takes a long time to recover. We have not developed the psychic endurance of resilience. The more often we love, the more resilient we are, the faster we heal, and the faster we become greater aspects of ourself instead of more insufferable victims of our circumstances. You may be harmed, but when your psychic endurance of resilience is at its peak capacity, you will recover very quickly and ultimately reach a vibration where you don't hurt and you don't attract harm. There is a reality where that exists. And we are shining the light of love into this dimension to awaken that heavenly realm for all. That is what it means to manifest heaven on earth, to bring to this world a frequency of well-being where no hurt or harm exists. And it starts by blessing those who have harmed us with all the joy their heart desires 
to lessen and shorten the time that we hurt. So try this out loud. I accept that while there may be harm, it doesn't guarantee hurt. Harm can be temporary. Hurt is the eternal remembrance of harm that lingers for as long as my heart stays conditionally loving. The state of conditional love is also known as judgment. To decide who gets more or less of my love only to withhold from myself the light of my highest perfection. And in knowing it is so, I allow all memories of harm from all incarnations, known and unknown, seen and unseen, remembered and forgotten to be cleared out of my energy field. Return to the source of its origin. Transmuted completely and heal to completion now. I accept that in the dimension of heaven the light is so obvious and ever present. It is the absent of hurt or harm. And in the name of supporting the awakening of humanity, I allow all patterns and paradigms of harm and hurt to be cleared out of my energy field and the energy fields of all in accordance with the Akashic records to be transmuted completely and healed to completion now. And from this moment forward, I invoke the vibration of heaven's glory to enter this moment, to enter this body, to enter this world, to enter this breath, to enter this heart, to enter this mind, to enter this field of consciousness, to enter this world for myself, for my loved ones, and for the greater good of all. May heaven's glory that I invoke bring about an absence of hurt, an absence of harm, the eradication of suffering that allows well-being to dawn And may it begin with me, blessing all hearts with all the joy that all sentient beings desire. For in a reality of ever-growing fulfillment, no one is the target. Everyone simply is the giver, receiver, and reflector of the love I am. From this moment forward, may I choose what love would do for the greater good of all. And so I'm free.
and to help bring heaven to earth as we just did, and I repeat after me, and to help eradicate pain and suffering off this planet and to bring well-being to life. For all sentient beings and for future generations to come, we say to all hearts, out loud, boldly, I love you. 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 You feel that vibration, that peace? That's your living proof of what we are all bringing to this planet by choosing to love as one. This is what I refer to as the love revolution. This is the movement I was inspired to help facilitate. And it is my honor and privilege to know that we, as almost 1,200 people, have created such gigantic waves of positive change that will continue to ripple out throughout this planet, throughout all continents, throughout all families, all communities. And just think of how incredibly this world will come together as one when we choose to love and dare to never stop. Who's with me? I didn't even know who Matt Kahn was a couple of weeks ago, and a friend of mine sent me a poem of his. And my mom has been diagnosed with stage four cancer, and I'm at, I've been having a really, really challenging time with that. And next thing you know, I see he's in Denver, I buy a ticket. In less than 12 hours, I watch the episode Dissipating Sadness, and it truly has transformed my life in such a huge way. I'm going from loving my mom through this to loving myself through this. And thank you so much, Matt. I can never thank you enough and I love you. He gives you that like practicality in the sense that he doesn't want you walking around holier than thou or better than other people. He knows that life is really hard and that most of us have suffered pain, shame, tragedy, hurt. And so he takes that and tells you you're still okay versus people pretending like maybe that didn't happen or you should just transcend that with no tools to do it. What really has drawn me to Matt's teachings is how centered it is around complete unconditional acceptance and love for anyone and anything. There's no requirements. There's no set of rules to follow. It's just all from here. And that's what I really like about it.